Today we're in part two of this conversation about uh, raising a generation that never knows a day without knowing Jesus. Really, as we go, mo- mothers, uh, moms, we had Mother's Day last weekend. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And we really talked about how to be a, really a godly parent and raise your children and challenge you with three gifts to give your children. Today, I want to pick up on that conversation. I want to give you three challenges today uh, to expose your children to three things specifically. But before we do, let me kind of start by the way of introduction. We are not challenging you to be a Christian family. We are challenging you to be a Christ-centered home. And the difference in a Christian family and a Christ-centered home is uh, Christian is uh, a term that is misused, overused, uh, applied to families that don't really know anything about loving Jesus or following Jesus. We want everything in our homes and in our lives brought underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. The Christian family believes in God and calls on God when there's trouble. The Christ-centered family loves God and it is their highest calling to serve him and honor him. You see the difference? And so we're bringing everything under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so in order to do that, uh, we want, in order to raise children to honor God, it is important that moms, dads, grandparents, anybody that is involved in raising a generation, especially in the body of Christ and local church, I want you to know um, what we believe as parents, as your pastor, how we've raised our kids, what we believe about your children and what we want to see uh, God do in your kids' lives. But it kind of springboards from this verse in Proverbs chapter number 22, verse number 6. A wise saying, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Here's what that literally means. It doesn't mean that they will always serve God. It means that they cannot get it out of their, their spirit. It cannot get it. You impress it upon their heart. You train up a child, and they will not be able to get away from that truth in their adulthood. Now, here's the interesting part about that. I actually believe, and listen to me, this is so important. I actually believe we're not training children up anymore. We're training them down. We're training them down. We're keeping them young and immature and emotionally unhealthy far too long. And as as parents, the early years of your children's lives are the most crucial and you are the greatest influence on your children up until five, six, seven, eight years old. And then all of a sudden the friend groups start coming in. And then all of a sudden relationships start coming in. And then depending on what you expose them to or allow them to be exposed to, culture really creeps into their life. And so I want to give you the most quoted prayer. We quoted this last week, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9. This is the most quoted prayer in the Jewish culture at the time. And uh, it talks about what it means to raise raise a child or train up a child in the ways of the Lord. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love your Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. So it says, Israel, parents, leaders, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. This is the same words Jesus used when he he reiterated this. And then he added, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And so we see this all the way back in Deuteronomy. Then it says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Pause. Press them down on your children. Imprint them. Stamp your children out with these beliefs and these values and this, uh, this idea of serving God. He says, impress them on your children. How do you do it? Talk about it. When you sit at home, when you walk along the road. Next verse, here, there you go. When you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Verse 9, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What he's saying is, in your life, the way you live and everywhere your kids go, they ought to see Jesus everywhere. Now listen, when they go to school, they're not going to see Jesus. On the sports field, they're likely not going to see Jesus. But when they're in your home, under your care, they ought to see it in your life. They ought to see it plastered everywhere. He said, put it on their, their, their wrist, put it on their foreheads, put it on the doorpost, put it everywhere, and also live a life in such a way that it impresses God's truth on your children. Talk about it over breakfast, on the drive to school, before bed. That's what a Christ-centered home is. We don't just let Jesus or, or, or God be a part of our lives. God is woven into every aspect of our life. And so here's what I believe. I'm going to give you three things that I believe we're doing wrong. These are not my original thoughts. I learned this from a pastor mentor that I believe has impacted my life uh, in ways, especially when it comes to parenting, probably more than any other pastor or leader. What are we doing wrong as parents today? Because things have shifted. We parent differently than we did 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Not that that generation had it perfect, but let's be honest. If you're in your 60s and you raised kids 30 years ago, you did it different than we're doing it today. Come on, somebody. 
If you don't believe me, uh, let me just give you a few things we're doing wrong. Number one, I think we risk far too little. We risk far too little. In other words, we have values in our homes, unspoken values in our homes, top priorities in our homes are to avoid risk and adversity and avoid pain for our children. Let me explain what I mean. Y'all remember when you're, you were growing up and your mom and dad would kick you out of the house in the summertime and say, come home at dark. Y'all remember where you didn't know nothing about no bottled water. It was, a, it was like whatever neighborhood, wherever you're at, you just go to the spigot, to the water hose, and you drink it, and it tastes like straight rubber. It didn't matter. We didn't have bottled water. Remember when your parents didn't obsess about your safety in a vehicle? Come on. Like it was nothing to take your whole 10-year-old baseball team, put them in the back of a pickup truck, and head down I-75. Anybody remember those days? I'm not saying that was a good idea. I'm just saying now you get beeped at in your driveway for not having your seatbelt on. Remember when uh, we didn't, we didn't, in, in parents ever, your parents ever have a Caprice Classic? Come on. You ever fall asleep in the back on the, on the, in the top of the, the thing and then your mama slam on brakes poof, and you hit the, yeah. Nothing about no, no seatbelts. We didn't wear bike helmets. Come on. No, that's what's wrong with us. We are concussed. Let's put your kids in bike helmets. All right, fine, but you ain't got to put them in a helmet to go check the mail. Come on. We are so overprotective of our kids in the wrong things. Now, there's some things I think you've got to protect your kids, but you've got to let them grow up. We, we, we try to protect them so much from physical and emotional pain and heartbreak. Now, listen, there's some things we've got to protect them from. We're going to circle back to that. That what happens is when we overprotect them, hear me, we rob them of their confidence. Because they've never had to overcome anything. They've never had to face adversity. We now have 16-year-olds that are like, I don't, I'm not ready to drive yet. Listen, when we were 16, if you didn't have your license five days in, you were thinking about stealing your dad's car. <laughs> now we got 20-year-olds that don't want to drive. Because they have no confidence. Why well, is anxiety through the roof? There's other contributing factors. Cell phones, technology, abuse. I get it. But, but we have kids that grew up in seemingly normal homes that they're anxious because they were overprotected and they never had confidence to step into the unknown. And so we have parents going to job interviews and sitting in the car with their 20-year-old. Dear Lord. No. My kid turned 16. I'm like, bro, you got to get a job. Because you got two years and I ain't paying for nothing. And so I gave him three months to get a job. You got three months to get a job. You're making $500 a week. 17 years old now. I'm not sitting in the car. How'd the interview go, buddy? <laughs> I know you only have your learners. We risk too little. And we've robbed them of believing in themselves. And in doing so, we've not allowed them to truly develop a faith in God. Because if, I mean, like they're struggling. You want to know why kids are struggling with their identity so much? Because we don't give them confidence in who God created them to be. And it limits their faith. And so without faith, Hebrews tells us, it is impossible to please God. Number two. We rescue too quickly. We rescue too quickly. Little Annie forgets her science projects due tomorrow. And mom and dad are up till 2 a.m. helping little Annie. Because we don't want her to get a D. Because that would destroy her life in fourth grade. Because it would look bad on you as a parent. That's why you don't want her to get a D. Let her get the D. Say, so here it is. Here's some construction paper. You can get a D for didn't do real well, but at least you tried. And I'm going to bed. And then we stay up late and we help her finish it. And then she gets an A and she wins. And then we celebrate our kid for doing nothing. 
Little, little Joe forgets his jacket. It's real cold outside. He goes to school without his jacket and he's cold. And mommy runs his jacket to school because you don't want Joe to be cold. Come on. This is the culture we grew up in, taking time off of work because little Joe forgot his jacket. But like, that's fine, bro. Next time you, you won't forget it. And so like at the end of the day, we rescue too quickly. We, we have staff that are late for work or their kids are late for work and their mom calls the boss. Come on. Like what culture are we living in? We're, you need to understand this. Listen, consequences make for an incredible teacher. In fact, that's what Galatians chapter 6 tells us, right? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. We're not even teaching our kids that they reap what they sow because we're letting them sow certain seeds and they're getting to reap the benefits that they should never reap. And so we rob our children from natural consequences and we wonder why they don't fear God because we rescue too quickly. Luke chapter 15, there's a story of a prodigal son, a wayward son who left his father's home. He comes to his father. Jesus is teaching his parable. He comes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now, long before it was due. Basically, what he was saying to his father was, you're already dead to me because I want your money. And I wish you were dead because I'd rather have your money than have you. And the father goes, okay. And he gives it to him because he's raised this child. This child knows and he gives it to him. And the child runs out to a foreign land. He wastes all his money on wild living and prostitutes. And, and he ends up sleeping in a pig's pen. And he thinks, I just need to go home to my father. And when he comes home to his father, the father welcomes him with open arms. He runs to the end of the driveway. But you know what the father didn't do? Rescue him from his consequences. He still didn't have an inheritance. He blew it all. But he still loved him in spite of that. Listen, you can love your children through the consequences of their decisions. Number three, we model too weakly. What do I mean by that? I don't believe most American church-going Christians have a deep faith in God. I believe they have a, um, a convenient relationship with God, which is not. Try having a convenient relationship with your wife. You see, it doesn't, doesn't really work. And if we're, not, if we're not serious in our faith, how can we expect our children to be serious in their faith? And so when it comes to parenting, when it comes to uh, raising children, and this is why it's so important, grandparents, uh, if, you, if you're an older brother or sister, whatever, it's so important that you understand this. It's more caught than what's taught. You can teach them everything, but they're going to watch how you behave. In other words, your children don't just become what you say, they become what they see. They become what they see. So if you say, did y'all ever have those parents that you said, do as I say, not as I do? How mad did that make you? You likely rebelled because of it. They become what they see, not what you Say, and the fastest way to drive your children, the fastest way to drive the next generation away from church is for mom and dad to be hypocrites, pastors and leaders to be hypocrites, to say one thing and live another. And so we got to model what it means. This is what Jesus said in, in Mark chapter number 7. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about, you, prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You want to drive a child away from church? You want to drive the next generation away from church? Let them see you say one thing and do another. Let them see you live your truth. The goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to be consistent. The goal is to, to actually go after God consistently, be authentic, model what it means to love Jesus. And so we risk too little, we rescue too quickly, and we model too weakly. So here's the question. What are we supposed to do? Well, there's this law the sociologists tell us. It's called the law of exposure. In fact, if you've ever been uh, in a season of life where you've been through counseling or you've had maybe some real hang-ups in areas or real inhibitions in areas, or they will do something called exposure therapy. And the idea is to expose you little by little over time, more and more and more repetitiously until you become comfortable living out that area of your life that you struggle with. 
And so sociologists call it the law of exposure. And there's like four or five different components of it. Some of it's environmental. Some of it's a choice to repeat things over and over. The more you expose yourself to something, the more it becomes a part of who you are. This is why when you're exposed to certain things at early ages and you start watching and being a part and learning and seeing those things over and over, now it shapes who you are as an individual. And so who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. We talk about exposure, the law of exposure for parenting. Who and what you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. It doesn't mean they're going to follow Jesus with their life necessarily, but it means when you put the deposits in their heart, they stay in their heart. They can't get away from the truth of God's Word no matter what they do when you live it out and you impress it upon their hearts. And so if you expose them to bad attitudes all the time, guess what? If you expose them to over-sexualized images all the time, materialism, alcoholism, perverted thinking, prejudices, ungodly values, they will likely end up far from God. So what we do know is this. We can't force our children to love God, but we can expose them to people and experiences that increase the likelihood of their spiritual growth. Let that sink in. This is why student ministry and kids' ministry, and church, and serving are far more important than practice and sports. Well, they're only a kid once. Right, so you only have one chance to impress it on their hearts. And so I want to give you three challenges for you to expose your children to. This is what we want to do in our church. This is how we want to raise a generation that never knows a day without knowing Jesus. And this is what we try to do on Sundays, but it's more important that you do this throughout the week. If you're a grandparent, if you're an older brother, if you're an older sister, if you want to have kids one day, if you know a kid, here's what you can do for the next generation. You ready for this? Number one, here's the first challenge. Expose them to the joy of knowing God personally. Oh, see, when you have a deep relationship with God, you can find a joy in the middle of chaos. You can find a joy in the middle of pain. You can find peace that transcends all understanding. And when your kids see you live out your faith and joy when things are going crazy because you have a deep faith and a deep relationship with God, that will be one of the most impactful things your children can ever see. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 17. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. Do you want your kids to experience eternal life? Do you want the next generation? Do you want your grandkids? Then they let them see you have a joy in knowing and having a deep relationship with God. This means we make talking about God, talking about the things of God normal in our home. When we take them to school, when we sit down at the table, before we go to bed at night. Listen, when, when, when you listen to the conversations in your home, how many conversations revolve or center around God? Or when you're talking about school, or when you're talking about sports, or when you're talking about whatever, how many of those conversations is, is God woven in the fabric of? The other day my kid was watching some YouTube videos and he said, Dad, I was watching a YouTube video the other day, and he said, and he started talking about something he saw and how it didn't line up with God's Word. I'm thinking to myself, that's the kind of conversations I want to have. That's the kind of conversations I want. And it wasn't like he's exposed to something crazy. He was like, Dad, this YouTuber said this, and that's not what you've taught us. And so even when they're doing on the sports field, I was so proud of your attitude and how you honored God and you picked up your teammates. Not like, oh, man, you hit three home runs. That's great, but it don't translate to heaven. And so at the end of the day, we expose them to this deep relationship with God. Um, candidly, I, I expressed to you, we're in, we're in the middle of a little bit of a unique season as a family. Um, tough season as a family. And uh, man, there's been nights I've laid in bed and cannot sleep just because my mind won't stop. I've never experienced anxiety in my life, but I'm telling you in this season, my mind has rushed and rushed and rushed. And uh, Julie and I are leaving the country tomorrow for our 24th anniversary to hang out and spend some time. I can't wait to just shut this thing off. And uh, at the end of the day, I just, you know, was riding along down the road with my 17-year-old today, and I said, there was a deadline that was coming up that was beyond our, our control. We had done everything we could do after my, my dad's situation, all the chaos in the last 10 days for that. And I said, you know what, son? You know your dad's stressed. You see it. He's like, yeah. He's like, because I mean, I've been more disconnected the last few weeks and just by default taking care of my dad, my family, and various other things. And I said, sometimes things are just out of our control. And I said, this is where I just have to pray. This is how, I, and I told him, this is how I pray at night. 
This is what I'm saying to God. God, if I try to control it, then I don't let you control it. I talked about the frustrations, the worry, the anxiety, the doubt, the frustrations, the anger with the situation with my dad. I talked about it because he needs to see. But in the middle of all that, I want him to see a joy in serving Jesus. We've got to let them see. We've got to expose them. We've got to model it. We've got to be transparent. We've got to let them see us pray, seek God's word, worship. Here's the second one. Expose them to the presence and power of God in his church. This is why watching online is not the same. This is why attending half the time is not the same. This is why just showing up and getting in and getting out is not the same. It says this in Psalm chapter 92. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. You want your kids to flourish? Plant your, your, your children. Plant your family in the house of God. And so what does that look like for us? Well, we say a Christian family goes to church when it's convenient. But a Christ-centered family is planted in the house of God. What is not optional in your family? Ask yourself this question. What's not optional? School, for most of you who have kids. Work, going to job, going to the dentist, maybe. I don't know, maybe it is. Taking a bath, taking a shower, sports. What's not optional? We're, you just go because it's on the calendar. But then the weekend rolls around, and how many of you, let's be honest, look at each other and go, we going to church Sunday? You see the problem? Culture's winning the culture war. The number one thing that happens in our week as a family is we attend church together. We, we, when we, listen, I'm telling you, my kids don't want to, we'll go on a vacation, we'll be gone back to back Sundays or something. They're like, we can't be gone two Sundays in a row. My, my youngest boy serves in kids ministry. This morning he's got a 240 bracket play basketball game later today. I was like, do you want to sleep in and come with mom? Because you're there all three services. He serves one. He goes to Youth JV, and then he sits in here. I'm like, buddy, you don't have to do that. He's like, no, I can't miss. I got to go see my kids. He's 12. It's 12. You know when you're winning? When it's not your faith anymore, it's their faith. You know when you're winning? When it's not your church anymore, it's their church. That's when you're winning. I've always told my kids, look, you ain't got to be in church every time the doors are open, but you're going to be committed. 48 weeks a year, you're going to be Sunday, Wednesday, whatever, but you're going to be serving somewhere in that, in whatever area is most crucial to your, you're going to be involved in serving and growing. You're going to learn the discipline of tithing and giving. You're going to experience that. Why? Because we have to understand the power of the local church. Jesus said, I am the head of the body you are the body of Christ. That's what Corinthians tells us as well. We are the body of Christ. We work together. Nobody in our house ever ask, are we going to church Sunday? You're like, well, you're the pastor. Okay. I didn't become a pastor by not going to church. From the time I was 12 years old, I served in my local church. I've, there's never been a season in my life, uh, a year that passed by since I was 12 years old that I didn't serve in some capacity in my local church. Long before I was the pastor, long before I knew how to speak, long before I knew how to do anything spiritual. And it wasn't because I saw it modeled. You say, my parents didn't do it. Okay, you, you change your family tree. And so the moment your kids start serving, i never forget my boy was playing baseball when he's 14 years old, playing for one of the top 25 teams, top 50 for sure in, in, in America. We went to the World Wood Bat in Hoover, Alabama, and it was a season where he was in youth ministry. And we had talked about what it looked like to balance, put God first and church first, and then some situations transpired, and because he was committed to the team last minute, it pulled him out of a church several weeks in a row. We came back from Hoover, and he said, Dad, I don't want to play baseball anymore. I said, why? And he said, because it's taking too much time away from church and family. He said, I want to serve. I don't want to miss. And it was something we didn't realize was going to happen at the time, and we realized we'd never let it happen again, but he made the decision that, that day. He's not picked up a baseball since. It's their church. And so 
He's a neat freak. Um, he's a germaphobe. If you've ever talked to him, like there's never a hair out of place. Um, he stands out in a crowd just because he's so bougie. <laughs> Takes after his mom. <laughs> like I get up in the morning wondering what hair have I lost. He gets up in the morning freaked out if his hair's out of place. Because he's been combing it the same way since he was like four. He's just that, he's that organized. This last year, he said he wanted to go to Honduras. <laughs> he's a germaphobe. They stay in a team house. Uh, it's pretty nasty. Um, there's a, you have to wash your dishes with bleach water. Uh, you, you trickle from a PVC faucet to take a shower, hoping there's a little bit of warm water. The house was infested with mosquitoes when they got there. For all of you who want to go to Honduras, this is what you're getting yourself into. And Julie was like, he is not going to do, oh God, dear Lord. And so she, was, she went with him. And uh, man, you'd have thought that kid grew up in Honduras. You'd have thought he was called to that. Because he understood something. He's not just called to show up for church. He's called to be the body of Christ. And so I'm not bragging on my kids. I'm telling you, they can't have their own faith. He got a job recently and last year. He's making good money. He's like, Dad, he keeps hounding me. Dad, I need to get cash app set up so I can make tithing easier. It's his faith, not mine. Your kid, it's possible. Well, the kids this, this day and age, no, no, no. Can I post to you it's parents this day and age? And churches this day and age? And so, ask yourself, do you ever prioritize anything over church? Do you ever prioritize church over anything else? It shows what you value. Our job is to gradually shift dependence of our children off of us and onto God. And so we got to do it by exposing them to the power of the local church. Number three, expose your children to the power of the Holy Spirit. Three weeks ago, I did the back-to-back weeks on the power of the Holy Spirit, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. My hope and my prayer is that daily you're just saying, God, fill me up with your Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit. And you know what? I don't know. You might speak in tongues. You might pray in the Spirit. You might do what you might. You might get a revelation from God. I don't know. I'm just saying between you and God, I want you to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that you live your life according to the fruits of the Spirit. And at the end of the day, my challenge to you is to seek a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let them see you go after God in worship, not stand behind your coffee cup. Let them see you weep over the things of God. Repent of your sin. Confess your sin when the convicting power of the Holy Spirit comes up. Be vulnerable. Admit when you're wrong. Tell them when the Holy Spirit set you free from stuff. Tell them what the Holy Spirit's challenging you with. My kids have watched me in the last two years on a journey to deal with some things in my life, to grow in the power of the Holy Spirit through counseling and various things. But listen to me, I am for counseling. I am for small groups. I am for you sitting and listening to teaching that challenges you. But the power of the Holy Spirit can do more in a moment than any of that stuff can do in a lifetime. And some of you have been fighting it in so many ways, you got to let the Holy Spirit break you. Today's what they know is Pentecost Sunday, where we celebrate what happened in Acts chapter number two. And I want you to hear something. You got to put your kids in environments where they can be exposed to the Holy Spirit. And I can tell you, that's not, not on the baseball field, not in the school classroom. This is why I'm telling you, I, my kids will always go to youth camp to get away for a week and be in the presence of God and other believers and challenge. And like I said, we, we host that youth game. Why? Because I want them to develop their own faith, man. Be experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their life and in their friends' lives. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is a springboard passage. I, I encourage you to go back and listen to those two weeks. Peter replied after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People spoke in tongues. People heard them praying in their own language. The gospel of Jesus went to the whole world that day. Repent, he said, and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And here's what I love. The promise is for you and who? Peter could have left that out. 
He could have said, for you and all those who are far off. No, he said specifically, you and your children, don't forget somebody who's full of the Holy Spirit has the next generation in mind. So here's what I know. Parents and churches that are full of the Holy Spirit will always have a passion for the next generation. This is why, church, I will constantly tell you to protect your children. I'm not saying play it safe with your kids when it comes to, like, letting them learn and grow up. I'm saying protect your children from the cultural wars that the enemy is pushing at them. I will constantly stand up and tell you, do not give your children cell phones at an early age. I've been saying it for 10 years. One of our elders sent me a message about two months ago and said, my God, Carl, I just, I'm reading this book, and here's, here it is. It's, the, it's four things that psychologists are showing by you giving a cell phone or technology to your child before they're 16 years old, what it does to their brain, the mental health problems, the addictions, the anxiety. And I've been saying it for 10 years. I'm not saying I'm ahead of the curve. I'm saying it's common sense. And we give it to them because it's easy. But I, listen, I'm going to fight for the next generation your kids and my kids. And if, if, look, if you're not willing to fight, I'm still going to fight for them. Because here's what I know. The enemy's fighting for them. The enemy's fighting for their identity. He's fighting for your family. And all I want us to do is go after the Holy Spirit, go after the things of God, model what it means, and expose our children to the opportunity to have a deep, authentic faith that when the world comes at them, they can say, no, 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 no. There's one name that is above all names. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His name is Jesus. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. I want to live my life for the glory of God the Father. Would you close your eyes? Stand on your feet. Let's close our eyes. And I just want to pray over you. And then I want to give you one chance to respond. Summer's kicking off. It's time to get beautiful weather outside and it's easy to miss on a Sunday, but let's be focused on the things. You're in town, you're here. You're on the lake, you're not hanging out. Would you close your eyes right now? You say, Carl, yeah, I got, I, got to, I got to bring some things into alignment to shepherd my children, my grandchildren, my younger brothers, my younger sisters, whatever it is. You just need the power of the Holy Spirit to help you in this season to shepherd the next generation. Maybe you, you don't have kids, but you can serve the parking lot and help, help, help park families when they come in. You can serve in kids' ministry. You can serve in the group. You can do whatever. You can be a part of raising the next generation by serving them. But you say, Carl, I just need help as a parent to, to navigate the season of my kids, whether they're two or 22. Would you just lift your hands right now? I know I'm lifting my hands. I got a 12-year-old heading into his teenage years. Father, all across this room, you see hands raised and hearts bowed. I pray today, God, that you would strengthen us, convict us, help us to go after you with our whole hearts, that we'd bring everything in our lives under the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lordship of Christ. And God, that our kids would see you in us. And God, that they would want to serve you because they see the joy of following Jesus. I pray as a church, we'd never lose sight of the next generation, that we'd go passionately after them. That we'd never lose sight of what the fact that what we do here is really what comes after us. Not what we do here, but what comes after us is what matters. And I pray this generation would do far greater than we've ever done in our lives. In Jesus' name. Now, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, you say today, Carl, I'm not living for Jesus. Or maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you're like the prodigal. You did your own thing. You blew your life. And you're looking at the season of life going, man, I, I need to give my heart and life back to Jesus. Maybe your family was a hypocrite. Maybe you walked out of church because you didn't see this model. But today you want to say, I want to give my heart and life to Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. You want to join with 18 people who made that decision in our first worship experience. When I say three, would you lift your hands all across this room? Come on, one, two, three. Come on, hands going up. Hands are going up, yeah. Wow. At least a dozen hands. Wow. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. You put your trust and your faith in Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. Turn from your sin, begin pursuing him. You will be made new. That's what it means to repent. Would you whisper these words to God? Dear God, I come to you right now believing Jesus is the Son of God who died for my sins and was resurrected. I ask that you would forgive me, that you would be Lord of my life, that you would help me to turn from my past turn from my sin, turn from my ways, and follow you. Today, I confess you as my Lord. I confess you as my Savior. 
thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, church, for at least 12 more people. Now, listen, before you go, here's what I want you to do. July 14th, we have a water baptism. We'd love to celebrate with you on that. Stop by. If you lifted your hand, stop by the I Choose Jesus wall. We have a box with some gifts in there for you. They can answer any questions you have, tell you how to take your next steps. Welcome to the family of God. Grab somebody. We'll see you next Sunday for Sunday in the South. God bless you.